afternoon, good evening. Uh, again, depending on whichever part of the world we are logging in from today. And welcome to the, uh, the 11th lecture in the series called the uh, Mysteries of the Universe uh, Institute Lecture Series at the Indian Institute of Technology, Roorkee, India. And it's a matter of great privilege and delight to welcome our distinguished speaker today, Professor Sheng Tung Yao. He obviously doesn't need any introduction, but uh, just for completeness, I would venture to say the following. Uh, Professor Yao is the William Casper Graunstein Professor of Mathematics, the founding director of the Center for Mathematical Sciences at Harvard. Uh, he is the director of the Yao Mathematical Sciences Center at Tsinghua University, China. Professor Yao, as we all know, is globally renowned for his contributions to the areas of differential geometry, partial differential equations, convex geometry, algebraic geometry, enumerative, uh, enumerative geometry, mirror symmetry, general relativity and string theory. He has an incredibly long list of awards and honors. I would mention a few of those. Uh, he was the Sloan Fellow in 1975. The Oswald, he got the, uh, the Oswald Veldman Prize in Geometry in 81. Uh, he was a recipient of the John J. Cardi Award for the Advancement of Science in the US, uh, awarded by the United States National Academy of Sciences in 81. Uh, he was a recipient of the Fields Medal in 82 for, I quote, his contributions to partial differential equations, to the Calabi conjecture in algebraic geometry, to the positive mass uh, conjecture in general relativity, and to real and complex Mongean pair equations. In 82, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 82, again, he caught the Guggenheim Fellowship. Uh, he became the MacArthur Fellow in 84. Uh, he got the Humboldt, the Humboldt Research Award, awarded by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation in 91. Uh, in 93, he was elected to the United States National Academy of Science. In 94, he received the Kraft Food Prize. In 97, he received the United States National Medal of Science. Uh, in 2003, uh, uh, he received the China International Scientific and Technological Cooperation Award for his, I quote, outstanding contribution in aspects of making progress in sciences and technology and training researchers. Uh, in 2010, he was, he was a recipient of the Wolf Prize in mathematics for, I quote, his work in geometric analysis and mathematical physics. And, and in 2018, uh, he received the Marcel Grossman Award for, I quote, the proof of the positivity of total mass in the theory of general relativity and perfecting as well the concept of quasi-local mass for his proof of the, of the Calabi conjecture for his continuous inspiring role in the study of black hole physics. So with that, I humbly request Professor Yao to kindly deliver his lecture. Professor Yao. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's an honor to give this lecture to a large audience, uh, including many of my friends in India. Um, well, my friend uh, Ramas gave the talk uh, on black holes last week. Clearly, he, we, he has given much better talk than mine, I think, because he has much, many more pictures than I would be able to show here. But in any case, I would like to uh, talk about something that may not be so well known to physicists and even to mathematicians. Some of the works were done about 40 years ago by me and Rick Shen, uh, my former co-worker co together. And um, so first of all, 40 years ago, when I did those works, people in the Institute for one study in Princeton did not believe black hole exists. They said that it's artifact by the mathematicians. Uh, it doesn't exist at all. But now time has changed. In fact, uh, about six years ago, uh, we form a black hole center in Harvard uh, with several major uh, uh, physicists, mathematicians, and astronomers together. I'm one of the PI. And in that center, it was uh, one of the leading, uh, it plays a leading role to found the shadow of black hole, which was a big news last year. And it's still going on. So it's an exciting period uh, to learn about black hole. And I would talk about it today from the point of view of a math mathematician. So I apologize that you will see more formulas that you would like to see, but I think without formula, it's probably difficult to explain uh, the actual meaning uh, from the point of view of mathematics. 
Okay, so uh, today, first of all, we will say that the concept of black hole actually has a long history. It was uh, started by uh, um, Laplace in 18th century, which proposed there should be objects whose gravitational fields are so strong that even light cannot escape. Well, that was a great idea, but on the other hand, nothing was able uh, to proceed because there's not much you can do. And this changes, of course, later. Uh, okay. Uh, so in 1916, uh, right after Einstein and Hubert uh, formulated the Einstein equation, Carl Schwarzschild, just a matter of a few weeks after that, they wrote down Sorosen to the Einstein equation. So it's a metric tensor, which can be written in this way, showing in the blackboard. So minus one, minus two, m over r, dt squared, etc. So this is a metric tensor for space time, uh, which is described by spherical symmetric uh, data. Well, this solves the Einstein equation uh, with vacuum, no matter. No matter is there, and it solves the equation. And it clearly has a singular point when r equals zero. At this point, the curvature of the metric goes to infinity. And at this point, all the physical law cannot be interpreted. Uh, in a standard way. So that's, a, in a way, it's a disaster because we don't know what to do. And uh, so, okay. It was proved by G.D. Birkhoff in Harvard in 1923 that the Schwarzschild solution is the only spherical symmetric solution of the vacuum Einstein equation. It represents a gravitational field outside any spherical symmetric body. Even uh, when there's other things around, uh, but then that means the singularity always is there. Namely, R equals zero is a singularity. So this gives a lot of trouble for interpretation and there's a, also a parent singularity when r equal to m. As you see from the, from the metric, when r equal to m, the coefficients becomes trivial at the first item, second item becomes infinity. So this is also a puzzle, but this puzzle was uh, solved uh, in, the, in, 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 late, in about a few years later, in 1933, it was realized that this is only coordinate singularity. That means when you change the coordinate, the singularity disappear. This is a very important fact. It was discovered again and again several times, uh, including in 1958. And this hypersurface uh, is an important hypersurface, R equal to M. It's called event horizon. It is a boundary of the region of space-time, which is which can be causal, causally connected to infinity. So it's called event horizon for this space-time, and this is an important uh, uh, fact. And the singularity bothers uh, people a great deal because um, uh, you cannot interpret what happens at that point. So many physicists said that well, because Schwarzschild Schwarzen has not a singularity. We can just ignore it, we can just perturb it, and then it will disappear. So this, uh, this part of view was held by many uh, relativities, uh, including uh, Lipschitz and several other peoples. This view was changed in 1965 by the major work of Roger Penrose. Uh, Roger Penrose wrote a paper in 1965, appeared in Physics Review Letter, is called gravitational collapse and space-time singularity. So that was a major paper, uh, and and let us understand some concept or call some concept called closed trap surface. So he invented this concept in 1965, and it has been used all the way up to now for all theoretical study of black hole. So it's a space-like two-dimensional surface 
such that the two family of now geodesic or functional to sigma are convergent as sigma. So what it means is that the outgoing light rays are dragged back uh, and converge. So light rays cannot go out infinitesimally along this space-like surface. Now, the important thing is that Penrose used his uh, argument to prove that the existence of such a closed trap surface implies that the space-time cannot be complete. That means there's some singularity somewhere. And this is very important because it shows that the closed trap surface cause problem for space-time. The geodesic in the space-time could not go to infinity as a result of this uh, closed trap surface. The proof is by contradiction, it's very nice proof, but it's not constructive proof. And this whole theory is further developed by Hawking and Penrose later together. And this becomes an important, uh, very important uh, uh, tool to understand the and this diagram is drawn in 1965 paper by Penrose and so the collapse of matter inside the black hole. So, so you see the light cone structure in the space time uh, and you see the star collapse, uh, matter will all inside the black hole after a while. And inside the black hole, the light cone turned inside and it could not escape. So the time progress progresses from bottom to top, and this uh, shows that uh, singularity must be appearing in the center, as you can see. Okay, so this is a beautiful picture. And first of all, Roger Penrose point out that closed trap surface exists in the above Schwarzschild solution, and therefore Schwarzschild solution has a singularity which we know anyway. But the important thing is that if we perturb the source a little bit, then we know the closed trap surface still exists. Because the definition of the closed trap surface is clearly stable under perturbation. And therefore, singularity will always exist if the space time is close to source field. So now when the space time is close to source field, you may not have any symmetry anymore. So the idea that symmetry can be can be perturbed away and cure the singularity, this idea does not work anymore. So what Penrose and Hawking saw is that singularity appear in Schwarzschild's horizon is not cannot be perturbed away, and therefore it's stable, and therefore we see some black hole could exist. However, Penrose and Hawking could not explain under what condition in a general space time, a closed trap surface would exist. Uh, it, they know that it exists in the case of Schwarzschild because it's there. And they know that it still persists to be there because it can be perturbed and deformed a little bit and it should still be there. So it, left, it, it is left with a very interesting question under what condition a closed trap surface would arise in a more general space time? And if it arises, by what mechanism? What makes this closed trap surface to appear? So this is an important question that Rick Stern and I uh, uh, addressed to in 1983, uh, appear in communicative math physics. Um, well, uh, it appeared in a basically mathematical journal, so very few physicists noticed this paper, although the Princeton I gave several talks in Princeton at that time. So we gave a first uh, existence uh, demonstration based on general relativity, the principle of general relativity, based on the first principle of general relativity, how a closed trap surface would form. Uh, so this is the first precise statement we can do, and we demonstrate that the statement is also good. Uh, assuming general relativity is okay. So, so I'm going to show it to you now. Now, there's some part which is slightly technical, but I think 
uh, you could, uh, uh, I hope you can bear it. So first of all, panels, in order to understand black hole, introduce the concept of now infinity. These are the places where the light ray would travel to. And it defines a future event horizon as a boundary of the causal path of all the future now infinity. He proved the following statement, which is a more mathematical statement than the one that I just told you this slide earlier uh, by using uh, some English, that's all. Here is the mathematics statement. He said, a space time cannot be future, now geodesic complete. That means if you travel along some geodesic, you may end up nowhere. You may not go to infinity. And if some assumption like one, two, and three exist, then a closed trap surface would appear. So, uh, no, a closed trap, I'm sorry. She proved that the space time is not geodesically complete if one, two, and three appears. So first of all, number one is a condition which holds for all classical matter that we know of. So this is something called energy condition, which I will not go into detail into explaining that. The second one is that there's a non-compact Cauchy hypersurface in M. That means for certain time, the universe is non-compact. And the third condition is that there's a closure surface in M. This is a condition I mentioned earlier. These are space-like two-dimensional surface where light could, could, could not travel out infinitesimally. So he proved this statement, uh, which demonstrates that uh, source field singularity is stable. But now number three is a question I want to address to. How do we know such a surface exists? Okay. So that's a major question we want to say. So based on this theorem of panels, we call a closed trap surface a black hole. <laughs> So what is definition of black hole? We don't really have a good definition. There's event horizon or apparent horizon, uh, which I don't want to go into detail what that is technically. We just call it, call it closed trap surface. Once it exists, it's called black hole. And this, are, this is a surface that will make sure space time will have some singularity and also light cannot get out. Now to formulate, uh, what I want to say in more uh, uh, precise manner, I want to tell you something called initial data formulas on general relativity. So space time is four dimension. We want to, a, to, to give you a three dimensional uh, hypersurface of this space time. So space time has the time and the space. Here I'm giving you a space uh, three dimensional space inside the space time. As a result, there's a metric, GIJ, which allows you to measure distance in the universe that we are sitting in. So at certain time, T equal to constant, I have a universe, three dimensional universe, and I have a metric. Besides the metric, we have to know how does the space vibrating in a space time. So this is a linear momentum of the space. There as they're sitting in the space time. So GIJ and HIJ are called uh, metric and second fundamental form, or sometimes called momentum. And given that, we have some matter. Metric, GIJ, and symmetric tensor, HIJ, are the description of space time without talking about the matter. But now I'm also giving you a matter. One is called local density, called mu, and a local current density, called J. So if you're sitting in your laboratory, you measure the matters around you. One is called mu, one is called J. Okay. So it turns out mu is the matter density, J is the local current density, and they must satisfy two equations. This is called constraint equation. Uh, mu is equal to half scalar curvature minus the norm of H plus summation H I squared. And J is the gradient 
a divergence of Xij minus the trace of it times Tij. So the left-hand side of this equation is a matter. Mu is a matter density, J is a local current density. And the right-hand side is given by gravity, namely R is a scalar curvature of the metric, and H is a linear momentum of the universe at that point. So this is part of the Einstein equation, which shows how matter is linked to the metric and the linear momentum. So these four equations here all together, and this is called a constraint equation. In principle, based on this data, we can evolve the, uh, uh, the universe according to the Einstein equation, and we can know the future. Uh, that's basic uh, assumption we are trying to do. Now we shall assume mu is bigger than equal to the norm of J. This is what we call energy condition. It is true for all classical matter as we know it. The local matter density, uh, local energy has to be non-negative. And this is what this inequality says. So this bottom inequality will be assumed throughout the whole talk. So now what do we have? We have four equations, which is the Einstein equation and linking the matter on the left-hand side to gravity on the right-hand side. Gravity is represented by the metric Gij and Hij. Now, we want to define more precisely what a closed trap surface means. So a closed trap surface is a two-dimensional space-like surface. It's a surface sitting in our three-dimensional manifold. Is a surface in our universe. Uh, it's called a plane horizon if the mean curvature of this surface is equal to trace of H, where H, as I told you, is a linear momentum tensor, is a trace of it over the surface. So roughly speaking, this equation says that either the outgoing or incoming light ray will be dragged back and converge. And as I said, uh, this was demonstrated by Penrose and Hawking that this will imply the four dimensional, dimensional space time is not geodesically complete. So from now on, we will call the apparent horizon to be a black hole. Uh, this is a uh, statement that we make uh, because we do not know the dynamics of Einstein equation in a full generality. So we have forced to call this guy to be a black hole. So uh, with this preparation, I now describe um, what Rick Schoen and I did in 1983. We approach a problem of existence of a closed trap surface by establishing some important freedom, which we use to prove the positivity of total mass for an isolated physical system. Very complicated system is a very nonlinear system and it has no symmetry in general. So, even the definition of mass is a problem. And the proof of the positivity of that mass is far more complicated than what people think. And this was open for a long time until Rick Stern and I proved it actually. So, this gets a little bit more technical, but I will show it to you uh, what we prove. So in 1983, uh, Rick Schoen and I proved the following statement. If the matter density, which is measured by mu minus j. So you look at a clump of a, um, a domain, a, a domain inside your universe, take this room, the classroom. If mu minus j, which is the matter density. So matter density is uh, including the, our body, the table and all this has a matter density. If the matter density is bigger than equal to constant, positive constant in this classroom, and if the radius in this classroom is less than equal to this constant, square root three over two, pi over square root c. It's a very well clearly defined number. And under this assumption, <coughs> we prove that a black hole forms. So this is a rather remarkable uh, statement actually, uh, because, uh, we make no assumption on the symmetry of the space time, and we do not make any special assumption on the state of the matter. Uh, so in many papers, people 
make assumption on symmetry or assuming the state of the matter, of, for example, the pressure linking to the density and all that has some condition. But here we actually make no assumption on what kind of matter will contribute <clears throat> to the space time and no assumption on symmetries also. So only matter density is used. So mu minus j is bigger than equal to c, bigger than zero in the domain, and the radius is less than equal to that. Now, suppose we put it a little, 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 little bit differently. Suppose we look at a neutron star. And roughly, the neutron star is this, this radius about this, if we normalize the, the condition correctly. What it says that if the matter density is more dense than neutron star by roughly two times of it, then the whole thing will collapse to the black hole. So basically, this statement says that when a neutron star is, you're putting more matter in the neutron star, then it will go all the way to a black hole. So this is a statement we can prove, and we prove it rigorously. Now, how do we prove it? I'd like to uh, point out the way that we prove it. I think it's interesting. Although physicists may not like this uh, to see more detail, but I think it's instructive to understand how mathematicians work on this problem. So the problem is uh, the, the, the statement I make is a clear statement, which says that if matter is very large in some region, a black hole will collapse. Uh, this statement, of course, you learn it in popular magazine, and they just talk about it, but they did not realize that it can be formulated in a very accurate manner. And those scales that I wrote down is pretty precise, actually, and also very accurate uh, uh, when you compare with some black hole. Now, the major argument, uh, that major tool we use to prove the above theorem is non-trivial. So the statement I, I make about the existing black hole based on many, many technical statements which accumulate together, the whole proof probably takes more than 100 pages long. But I break it down to several important statements because I think they are useful, in fact. So what we need to prove, uh, what the, a technical tool that we use is the following theorem, which we prove also. Namely, we prove that if we have a region, so like this classroom, as I said, if the boundary classroom is mean convex in some uh, 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 I mean, uh, in some technical sense, if the mean curvature of the boundary is bigger than the trace of that along the boundary. So it's on the boundary of the region. So the region cannot be too funny, that's basically what it says is. <coughs> then we prove a very remarkable statement. Inside this room, inside this region, there's no apparent horizon. There's no black hole. And then, this assumption, if there's no black hole, then there's a unit solution to the following equation, which I write down here. Where F is the unknown, we said that if black hole does not exist in omega one, in the whole classroom here, a F would exist. Gij is given, is a way to measure the distance, the metric tensor, and Hij is a linear momentum, I told you earlier. So this equation will exist globally over whole omega one if the apparent horizon does not exist. Now this uh, is a funny statement, but it's a major tool we have been using in classical general relativity for the last 40 years. What it says, you can turn it around. It says that if this equation does not admit a global solution, then a black hole must exist. The apparent horizon must exist. So we prove that if there's no black hole, then it's unit solution and exist. We turn it around saying that if this uh, equation cannot be true, then a black hole exists. So it's logically the same statement, but it's this statement that we can prove the last statement. So I want to demonstrate how you can prove this statement. The proof is actually interesting. That's why I want to show it to you. This equation was actually first studied by Zhang, a Korean, physicist, but she gave it up because she thought that it cannot have a good solution and therefore it's useless. But Rick Shen and I, 
found out a uh, the worst uh, interesting lesson is far more interesting than Zhang uh, Liu. Namely, we do the following thing. We perturb the equation a little bit uh, by putting epsilon f on the right hand side. You see, in the previous uh, uh, slides, we don't, the right hand side is set with zero. Here I put epsilon f, where epsilon is positive. When epsilon is positive, we can prove that uh, such an equation always has a uh, smooth solution, whether there's a black hole or not. So a smooth solution always exists, and we call it f epsilon. So this is an interesting statement in contrary to the case when epsilon goes to zero. Now, then we look at this equation with f epsilon uh, exists there. And the key observation is that a subsequence of f, f epsilon converges smoothly in the neighborhood, neighborhood of the boundary when epsilon goes to zero. So f epsilon exists always in a smooth solution and it converges smoothly when epsilon goes to zero, but only in the neighborhood of the boundary. But it may blow up. F epsilon may blow up vertically along a surface sigma in omega one. So F, X, F epsilon become vertical in, when epsilon goes to zero along some two dimensional surface. And this surface we prove must be the black hole. So, so what do we do? We prove a perturbed equation of what Zhang had always exists. And it will converge smoothly in the neighborhood of bounded omega. So it has something, but it blew up along a black hole. So therefore, we observe that if a black hole does not exist, F epsilon will converge everywhere. So you solve the equation. Uh, we can prove. The proof of this statement is not trivial. Uh, well, I won't go into detail of that. Um, so I want to, uh, this is a statement we, we use. I want to write it in a more geometrical manner so that uh, we understand this, pop, this uh, film uh, more detail. So I look at the domain omega one, and then I take a product with R. So F epsilon actually becomes a hypersurface in omega one cross R, because you look at the graph of the function in omega one. Omega one is a graph, is a function of omega one. Omega one cross R contains its graph. And the mean curvature actually on omega one cross R turns out to be very nice, and it becomes this equation. This equation is the same kind of equation that we look at in the case of two dimensional surface, which defines the concept of a plane horizon, which is the definition of black hole that I use to define. So this is a very nice uh, equation. And what happens is that in this new uh, uh, graph, which sits in omega one cross R, so there exists a new submanifold given by the graph. The graph of F is dividing a submanifold, three dimensional submanifold. It has itself a second fundamental form, which we call a PIJ. The graph is x dot fx, as I said here. And it turns out a, we derive a very important formula uh, by calculation. This is, takes a non true work to calculate. Namely, we look at our bar to be the scalar curvature of this graph is satisfied this inequality. Where mu minus j appear on the right hand side. <coughs> now remember what's mu minus j? Mu minus j is a meta density. So what we achieve is that the meta density, which is a physical quantity, is related to the geometry of the space time by the left hand side in terms of scalar curvature of the graph. So this is a very important inequality that we can use. And this inequality allows us to do some induction hypothesis, induction. So this eventually is linked to the spectrum of some operator 
which I'm always happy to see, to see some spectrum or some operator arise in general relativity. So anyway, I construct um, using uh, the Zhang equation that I wrote down earlier, I construct a new three dimensional manifold which satisfies this inequality. Now, it turns out if I take M to be the mass density, mu minus J, the matter density, I, I mean, the above inequality implies that for any function vanishing on a boundary, integral M phi square is less than equal to the right hand side, integral half out bus phi square plus d phi square. <coughs> so, what does this inequality tell you? This inequality tells you you look at the operator minus Laplace bar plus R bar over 2 minus M. This operator acting on L2 of omega red bar, this eigenvalue is non negative, the first eigenvalue. This is what this inequality said. So, what do we construct? We found a inequality assuming there's no black hole. Uh, we found a, a statement in certain Hubert space. I construct an operator minus R plus and bar plus R bar over two minus the matter density to be non negative. So, I want to now use this statement that the first eigenvalue is non negative to proceed to find something interesting. So let me show it to you. Uh, so the reduction goes in the following way. We prove a lemma, so to speak. This lemma says that if the first eigenvalue of the operator is non-negative, and if I define lambda to be this uh, gadget that I write down here, Minimum of one over L CO integral from CO to L of MS psi square S pi over L DS. What is this thing? I take gamma to be any curve drawn at X to the boundary of omega one. So if I'm sitting in this classroom, X is a point that I'm sitting in. I take all the possible curve drawn from X to the boundary of this classroom. I integrate that uh, uh, integral along the path. I get a number by minimizing among all possible gamma going to the boundary. So, of course, uh, psi square is supposed to be equal to one instead of putting psi square there. It is just uh, integral of the matter density along this path, average matter density. Uh, so, I take lambda to be minimum. Remember, ms is non negative. If ms is positive in some region, uh, in some ring around me, uh, some cell around me, this will be strictly positive. So I proved that, uh, Rick Schoen and I proved that if the radius of omega one is less than equal to this number, then a black hole will form. So this is actually improvement of the previous uh, statement I make, where I say if the matter density is bigger than equal to C, then it's, big, it's less than that. Here I allow some uh, possibility of M to be zero, trivial in some region but large in some cell. So this gives you a, some procedure to allow the black hole to form, even though the matter density is not uniform everywhere. Now, so let me show you, demonstrate to you how we prove this statement. This statement is rather fascinating to me because we use a dimension reduction argument, which uh, I think is the first time ever uh, used in geometry. And um, so I'd like to demonstrate to you, this argument is used later, much more later. But here, so let me tell you how we, how we do this induction. I will go, go a little bit fast in case uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you don't follow. Given the manifold M, the free dimension manifold, we have a scalar curvature and we have the operator to be positive. What we do is that we look at the first eigenfunction of this eigenvalue problem, where lambda is non negative. You remember our assumption is Laplacian plus m minus r over 2 has positive first eigenvalue. So this equation shows that is the case where I assume lambda is non negative. And the first eigenfunction always has positivity, f is strictly positive in the omega 1. 
So I have a positive function, which is the first eigenfunction, the ground state for this operator. So the ground state is useful. And what I do is that I use the ground state to deform uh, the, the metric. So I take a curve from uh, gamma, I take a gamma to be curved, so that for any sigma, for any sigma spanning this gamma, we define functional by putting the f there. f is the first eigen function, which is positive. I define new area function with a weight. The weight is f, the first eigen function. I integrate over sigma. And among all this, uh, um, among all this uh, sigma, given a given a curve gamma, I then minimizing the functional uh, a f sigma to produce a sigma, which minimizing this functional a f. That's what we do. So given a Jordan curve inside our region sigma one uh, omega one, I minimizing this. And I can prove such a uh, uh, sigma exists uh, by standard argument that we knew of. And since it's minimizing the functional, we know the second variation of this functional is non negative. And therefore, I can find another operator that looks more complicated. But if you uh, uh, streamline it, it's actually not so bad. This operator L would be non negative. Uh, that's followed from the fact the second variation formula is not negative. So what we do is that over this, this we have found a uh, functional uh, L, I mean, an operator L, which is non negative. And as a result, I can also take this uh, first eigenfunction again. So, so what the first eigenfunction is, so I, so, I look at this uh, function, I look G to be the first eigenfunction L. So now I go from three dimensions, three dimensional manifold to two dimensional survey sigma. Now I'm going from sigma to one dimension again. So I take G to be the first eigenfunction L, and then I take a pawn now on sigma, and which lies inside sigma, and I'm minimizing the space or curves, gamma joining the pawn to the boundary. So integral fg. So f is the first eigenfunction that I found for the first operator. G is a sec is another first eigenfunction of a different operator restricted to the curve gamma. So with this one, I can minimize it again. And I found another operator, second variation formula, shows that this operator is non negative. So I'm going through induction from three dimensional manifold to two dimensional surface from two diamond surface, I go down to a curve. And finally, we prove that this operator on the curve now is non negative, has first eigenvalue in this, uh, this interval CO to L is non negative. But this is an operator which we know how to handle <coughs> much easier is ordinary differential equation. And if I define capital lambda by this one it's very easy for you to work on it and then you prove this uh, this statement. Well, if M is constant, of course, you know, this is stern real wheel uh, harmonic oscillator, you can calculate everything. If M is non is not uh, a constant, you still can derive this statement that I wrote down here. So it is in this way, I prove the length of the, uh, the radius of the domain is less than equal to this number, where lambda would be the lower bound of the matter density. So this gives rise to the statement I proved for you in the case of black hole. So this is the, the statement I use the matter density inside to prove it, but this statement can be strengthened if there's no matter, even if there's no matter. The previously, Rick Schoen and I say that if the matter density is very large, a black hole will form. But now, even if the matter is trivial, there's no matter inside, the boundary on that hand could contribute something for a black hole to exist. The, so I call this uh, paper to be exist a black hole due to boundary effect. So the black hole, uh, the boundary is very large in curvature, it could be also exist. 
Now, actually, there are many other arguments you can use uh, to prove black hole exists. There we use the uh, density large to prove existence. But if you rewrite this uh, equation that we got from Zhang, you can conclude this statement. Integral of the divergence is less than your bounded omega. And you can prove that uh, using divergence theorem that if the Hij, the linear momentum is bigger than a constant times Gij, lambda times Gij, you could you set capital lambda to be to be the mean curvature H minus lambda, then you, you can prove this statement. So therefore, you can also prove that if this uh, holds, there's a condition of Hij, you can also prove existence of black hole. So there are many other statements you can prove uh, existence of black hole. Lambda need not be constant, and then you can find an operator to make sure the black hole exists also. So there are various kinds of uh, condition you can prove exceeds a black hole. But the most interesting one was the one that I just uh, stated, namely integral or the mean curve of the mass density large, then you form black hole. And you can prove uh, uh, such condition will, will, will form even at the beginning. It does not hold by the errors on Einstein equation you will hold at a later time. Let me not go into to that later. There are many more uh, generalizations of this statement due to many people. So let me not go into that. Uh, now, uh, we can generalize uh, many of these statements uh, further and further, but we should find it, find it difficult to, to understand better because uh, we found that the definition of mass, linear momentum, angular momentum are not so well defined. The, in general relativity, what we use about mass, linear momentum, angular momentum uh, are usually for isolated physical system. And so it is a important question when I address to the existing black hole that I have to go back to see what was known before. The problem actually went back about 100 years ago when Einstein and Hubert construct the field solution. The field equation is very nonlinear in nature and has no symmetry. So how to define the classical quantity? This becomes a major problem up to now. The equivalence principle demands that every physical quantity should be independent of the choice of the local measurement, local frame for measurement. But we know that from geometry that when the metric, uh, uh, which is defined by the, by the gravitational <coughs> potential, it has a normal frame where the first differentiation of the metric tensor is zero. Uh, we can always choose such a, a frame. As a result, general relativity exhibits great difficulty in defining mass density uh, because the mass density would depend on the first order differentiation of the potential. And yet it could be set in equal to zero in some frame. That means it must be identical zero. So general relativity already shows big difference from Newtonian mechanics on this point of what mass means. So, uh, so if I want to um, discuss the previous question, I will encounter difficulty because we don't know what mass means. Uh, if we want to replace matter density by a mass, total mass of the subject. So, it's also important if we want to define a binding energy of two binary stars interacting with each other, because we need to know the mass of each star in order to define the binding mass. And therefore, we need to know to define something called quasi-local mass. This was already considered way back in 1970s by Roger Penrose and also by Hawking. In fact, uh, in my book, Seminar in Dependent Geometry, uh, published by Princeton University Press, panels list this one as the first major problem in classical general relativity, namely to define what a mass means for a local domain in space. So this has been puzzling for a long, long time. And many attempts has made, been made to make a good definition of such a quasi local mass in the last 50 years. And I put down some assumption that it must satisfy in order for it to 
to be uh, meaningful, uh, what quasi-local mass means. And so the first condition is to be gauge independent, cannot be depend on the local frame, and it should be non-negative. And it has to be trivial when the surface is not sitting, or when it has to be trivial when it's <coughs> because Minkowski space time has no uh, gravity. So any surface sitting inside should measure nothing. And this you know, the locking condition turns out to be very, very difficult. So what you are trying to do is that given a two dimensional surface, you want to associate some quantity in a functorial manner. So that is non-negative and non-trivial when it's not sitting in Minkowski space time and it's trivial in Minkowski space time. And the second one is the normalization. It needs to be the standard ADM or the bonding mass as spatial or now infinity. These are definitions which I don't want to go into detail, uh, but these are well accept uh, uh, definition that we know for isolated physical system with gravity. And this should be equivalent to the standard definition when the space time is spherical. So these are three innocent looking uh, requirement I want to put down on the crazy definition of crazy local mass, this turns out to be not trivial. Uh, there are probably more than 10 definitions was given uh, for crazy local mass. Only two definitions set right, these three criteria. One is given by my former student, Robert Barnick, and the other one is given by Wu Dao Wang and myself about 10 years ago. Uh, the first one is on more special space time where he treat the time symmetric case. The second one was partially motivated by the period as well, by Brown and York and Melissa Liu. So this is an interesting uh, um, thing to do, I think, because it and uh, answers, I think. In this definition that I did with Muda Wang, we associate to each closed surface a metric, a two-dimensional metric, and also a rank two bundle which describe the infinitesimal behavior of this surface in space time. So it's an SL2 R bundle, rank two bundle, which measures the dynamics of the surface in space time. So you may say the first statement is a metric which corresponds to the position of the graviton, and the second one corresponds to its momentum. And there's a mean curve vector in this rank two bundle, and there's a connection on this bundle. So this is the data that we are given. Given such a closed surface, abstractly given surface, with rank two bundle, we are going to associate a mass. And then we evaluate this quasar local mass of these two surfaces with this data, which I just mentioned, the metric plus sigma. Sigma is the, the we can do it quite well. And uh, suppose we embed, isometric embed this surface, two-dimensional surface, into the Minkowski space time. This part of our definition that we want to use. We isometric embed sigma in the Minkowski space time. And also, uh, we found a surface sigma not sitting in Minkowski space time with the same induced metric as sigma. Namely, the metric sigma is the same. And then we look at the quasar local mass in terms of the mean curvature of H of, of the original surface. H naught is the surface of sigma naught. Basically, we are defining quasar local mass by using these quantities, which I will show you to you now. <coughs> now, so the data is this. The physical data is a metric plus the mean curvature and give rise to this thing, the metric plus the norm of H and also its connection. We isometric embed sigma with this data into the Minkowski space time, given sigma to be the induced metric. And let sigma not be the image of this data under this map X. And then what we do is that I take any timeline uh, killing field of R3, one. For example, the translation matter uh, is one of them. And we define tau to be the dot product between T minus T and X. After that, so this looks like a top uh, uh, for, for, for the embedding. 
And then we define low to be this quantity and J to be this quantity. This is an interesting uh, statement. We derive it actually from, uh, from the first principle of Hamiltonian mechanics associated to the ADM formulation. It turns out low is always bigger than equal to J as a norm. And low is now become the, the density uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the embedding. And integral low turns out to be always not negative. And so this is, this is something we need to prove and we can prove it. And, uh, and among all these embedding, uh, we look at the optimal, what we call optimal isometric embedding equation. So this induced metric to be, uh, X is the metric in Minkowski's space time. I want it to be the given metric. And then this is the condition we want to put down. So we want to say that this J, this parent is divergence free. Uh, all this looks complicated, but we actually has a good motivation for it, which I do not have time to go into. And then this is called optimal isometric embedding equation. Optimal in the sense of minimizing energy in the right way is satisfied this equation. The quasi-local mass that we define would be this quantity, integral low. And this is a very interesting quantity because it reproduces everything that we want. And also it gives rise to a very beautiful properties of them, uh, which was not known before. Um, so uh, we proved that this quantity must be positively general and sealed for surface in the Minkowski space time. So this, this quantity is actually can be calculated uh, by computer, you can actually do it. And this is the energy associated to the quantity I mentioned earlier. We can also define other quasi-local conserved quantity. For example, for angular momentum, we go to a rotation killing field in R3, comma one, and the quasi-local uh, um, uh, uh, conserved quantity is defined by this quantity, where T is the, the, the embedding I mentioned earlier. And then we dot with JA, this time the low. So this is a matter density. This is the current that we have. So as a result, all the conserved quantity that we are interested in, classical one, can all define on this uh, surface, uh, the data that we are given. And uh, well, uh, this kind of property was uh, studied by, by us pretty extensively. Uh, so um, I, I should mention that, um, uh, let me bypass it. So, uh, angular momentum is especially interesting because it's a very uh, important question for a long time, which we solved recently. This is a care metric, which has angular momentum given by A. And this angular momentum uh, turns out to be the same as what, what we define by using the, the local quasar local quantity we use. And quasar, angular momentum is a difficult thing to do in a classical way because it diverges easily. But it turns out by using this formulation, we were able to prove, uh, uh, to clarify most of the concept that we want. And then, so we allow us to formulate a conjecture. The reason I go for this is that it allow us to stay at least to formulate conjecture, which went back to Kip Ford many years ago. Namely, if a place a local mass of closed surface with space like mean curvature vector is large compared with its circumference, a black hole should form. So we can at least state the statement, but we are not able to prove this statement yet. Uh, we can prove it in some special cases, but not uh, enough. Uh, but in any case, uh, I think it's fascinating to continue uh, to research in this dilation because we see some interesting uh, definition and text actually it's not just definition because in order to demonstrate this definition satisfy all the classical requirement, there's a huge number of work to, that we need to produce to demonstrate them. And recently, Pundan Chen, my for, former student, and Mu Dao Wang, and uh, Kik, uh, uh, Ye Kai Wang, and I make use of the definition of quasar local angular momentum to study the flux of total angular momentum for asymptotically fresh space time, which respect the symmetry of the global BMS group and now infinity. 
This has been a major problem for a long time. We were able to fix the quantity to make sure this makes sense, the flux of total angular momentum. This is important to understand the gravitational radiation that are created by angular momentum. So many people believe that the, the content of gravitational radiation are created by angular momentum. So at least we have write down the definition and what it means and what it's supposed to be. So uh, there are also many questions relating angular momentum of black hole relate to its total mass, which I do not have time to go into. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Professor Yao. Thank you uh, for th that incredible, uh, rather technical, but rather truly incredible yeah. lecture. Thank you yeah. so much. Can we please have a round of applause for Professor Yao's lecture? Okay, um, so we have a couple of questions. Uh, would it be okay to take them up now, Professor Yao? Sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, they are rather uh, just notations. So uh, there's a small uh, query by Manu Srivastav and the query is, how, it, how is HIJ defined, the second fundamental form? Well, basically, you take the position vector of the metric uh, of the embedding, you defense it second times, and then you project in a suitable manner, then you, you get a second fundamental form. So second differentiation of the embedding and project it into the tangent space in the right way. All right. Um, there is a second question again, uh, notational. Uh, I think it's Guang Wan who is uh, asking, which is, what is RAD, R-A-D? Uh, so I guess this has to do with the theorem of uh, RAD of omega one. Uh, in well, how, how AB is, uh, you, is talking to Richard Tetzer? I think so, I think so. Yeah, well, I mean, the Einstein equation, uh, half the Einstein equation uh, written in terms of how AB. Oh, you're talking about this one? No, no yeah, sorry, this one, yeah. This one, the radius, radius is the yeah. radius. So the, the size of omega one, if the size of omega one is large enough, compare with C, uh, or maybe put it another way, uh, if there's enough region where, the, uh, um, where, where the matter density is large, then, 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 you, then you have uh, a black hole. That's what this statement means. So let me show you, show you back to the original statement. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay, okay. right. And uh, so I think uh, in the absence of more questions, maybe I could squeeze in a, a query of mine with your permission. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, if, I, if I recall in about 2005 or so, there was, I think a paper by uh, Galloway and uh, your friend, Richard Schoen, uh, right. which, which had to do with, I believe, uh, looking at uh, higher dimensional solutions of the Jang's equation and right. your theorem. So uh, what is the status of that work now, or uh, that, that kind of work? And the second has to do with, uh, though you mentioned, you talk about these isometric embeddings into Minkowski and spaces, but I mean, are these, are your theorems and uh, easily extendable to Minkowski and space times? Well, in high dimension, um, of course, uh, the positive mass conjecture uh, holds. Uh, for a long time, we don't know whether it's true for dimension bigger than equal seven, but Rick Shen and I was able to overcome the difficulty to prove that in general. And for that paper, Galloway, I don't think they have written anything more about that. Now, for the theorem that I'm proving here, uh, we do have to make some assumption on two dimension, three dimension, three plus one dimension, because uh, some two dimension feature was used partially because the isometric embedding uh, is not true in high dimension. So uh, two dimension surface can be embedded in R3, one isometrically without any problem. 
because any surface can be isometric, embedded into three-dimensional hyperbolic space form. The hyperbolic space form is one of the hyperbola in the light cone. So it always exists. And it, it is infinite dimensional in fact. So any surface can be isometrically embedded into R3, one. But this is not true in three dimension. It, it cannot do it anymore. So I think you do not require it to be isometrically embedded in high dimension. You, you just preserve something, not everything. But this needs to be explored. And, and probably just related, uh, uh, just more or less exactly the same thing, but I'm just rephrasing my question, which is, uh, so you, you, you took us through these arguments of dimensional reduction. Is dimensional right. oxidation an arguments uh, possible to be applied to uh, get higher dimensional uh, analogs of your theorems? Oh yeah, we, we, we do that in high dimension. That's the argument we use to prove the positive mass conjecture in high dimension. We still do the dimension reduction. Okay. Dimension reduction, I encounter some difficulty in dimension bigger than equal seven because of singularity of the minimal surface. Regularity on minimal hypersurface gave trouble, but it, it, it was overcome by us. Okay. Very good. Okay, so, uh, um, okay, there was a quick question which has just come in. Uh, yeah. And the question is by Indulekha, and the question is, please, could you please comment on the question of whether a charge at rest with respect to you in a gravitational field appears to you as radiating or not? Well, charge can come in all the way, there's no problem. Uh, 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 as I said, the, the matter uh, can be anything in our formulation. It's just internal <coughs> matter density. So we could have charge, we could have angular momentum, we could have all those. I'm not sure I understand the question correctly. All right, I think, uh, yeah, right. sorry. Okay, I think uh, with that, uh, we would thank you once again so much, Professor Yao, for taking the time out to, uh, yeah. to give a talk, a lecture in the series. Thanks yeah. so much. And okay. uh, thank you and uh, please okay. stay safe. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye, thank you. Bye. bye. All right, team, so we come to the end of the meeting. Uh, thanks once again. So, uh, yeah, uh, so there is a reminder. Uh, could you please, all of us, could, could we please fill out the response form, which is available, a link to, uh, to that has been given uh, in the chat session. Uh, so, hope to see you again. Uh, uh, April 14th for the next installment in the series, lecture number 12. All right, bye-bye, have a safe uh, weekend. See you April 14th, bye.